I will leave you to manage it. Cool. Yes, the lecture will be recorded for the YouTube channel. Can you hear me okay? Let me just, perfect. Fine, so my name's Manji, I'm a current F3 locum. Um, I'm aspiring to apply for anaesthetics training. So tonight's lecture is on overdose. Um, we have about nine questions. It should take around an hour. Um, so if anybody does need to leave early, the lecture will be recorded and available online. Um, so if you do miss anything, um, you can catch up at a later date. But I think we'll just get started really. We've got quite a lot to cover today. So, sorry to interrupt, Mandy, just to say your display is not that the slides, the whole screen. Right, it is on mine. Bear with me. Uh, that's odd. I can try swap. Yeah, maybe try swapping them again. Yeah. It's not coming up with notes underneath, it's, mm -hmm. it's just coming up with a different presenter display. How about this one? Is no, that it's still coming up the same. Let me try. I'm going to exit it, go back in. Um, it does say my screen sharing is paused, which it never normally says. Can you see my second slide? Yeah, so I can see a big one of the first slide and I can also see the next slide that's coming up. Oh. Whereas when you usually do it, I can just see the one yeah. slide that you're on in full screen. That's um, really odd. Um, yeah, maybe just stop sharing your screen and try again because you did get it working a minute ago. Yeah. Bear with me. That's really odd. I feel like every time we do this, it's always something different. <laughs> <laughs> always. Zoom never likes to play ball ever. No, every time we try this, it's always something different. Is that any better? No, it's still coming up the same. All oh, right, okay. Um, huh. That's the one we normally click. Let's try this one. How about that? Yes, now it's working. I didn't do anything different than I did the first time. <laughs> but okay, sorry about that, guys. We'll continue. Fine, so the aims and objectives, um, we want to go through the antidotes for common drug overdoses. It's useful to have these for hand um, when answering kind of short best answer questions um, in a kind of acute speciality. It's useful to just kind of know these off the bat. Um, so we'll go through a few of those. One of the um, objectives is to be able to differentiate between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. There is often a lot of confusion between the two. And then we'll go through the signs, the symptoms and the management of kind of um, nine or 10 common drug overdoses, as well as explaining the treatment nomogram for paracetamol overdose, because that comes up quite commonly. So what I'll do is I'll put up the first question and we'll give you about 40, 45 seconds to have a read of the question and the answers. And then a poll will pop up on the screen and then we'll go through them. Ten more seconds. <laughs> 
OK, so <clears throat> it's pretty split between A and B. <laughs> so a few of you might have picked up that obviously one of the learning objectives was about neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. It was about 20 percent have gone for malignant hypothermia. So the correct answer is actually uh, B, serotonin syndrome. So serotonin syndrome is more commonly associated with antidepressants and in particular SSRI and MAUI antidepressants. It can sometimes be caused by things like ecstasy and amphetamine um, and it's normally a combination of these drugs interacting which leads to too much serotonin and therefore serotonin syndrome. So it is potentially life-threatening and typically is drug induced so normally in the stem of the question there will be um, some indication that he's recently treated for antidepressants or he's recently taken um, an overdose of medications. So serotonin syndrome normally has an onset within a few hours, whereas neuroleptic malignant syndrome tends to develop a slightly later. So it's normally over days to weeks. So looking at the question, um, this states that he's taken some pills within the last 24 hours. So even without kind of reading the last question, it gives you a little indicator that we're pointing more towards serotonin syndrome. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome, it's more characterized by things like rigidity and bradyreflexia. And we will come on to both of those in a second. Since about a fifth of you went for malignant hypothermia, I just want to briefly touch on what that is. So it's a severe type of reaction and it normally occurs in response to general anesthesia. So in the stem of the question, there'll normally be a hint that they've um, recently undergone surgery and it's normally a very acute reaction and it's a certain subset of patients that seem to be susceptible to having this condition. What normally happens is the patient experiences a rapid rise in their temperature and it can also be potentially fatal. Um, there's a number of anaesthetics that can trigger it, um, especially halothane, and you normally have kind of muscle rigidity, tachycardia, hyperthermia, so very similar to A and B in terms of signs and symptoms, but the causative agents between A, B and C are very different, and I hope you can kind of appreciate that through the question. So what actually is serotonin syndrome? So it's a potentially life-threatening condition with an which is associated by an increase of seronergic activity in the central nervous system. So as we've mentioned, it normally presents within the first 24 hours of starting an SSRI or starting another medication which might interact with the SSRI. Um, there are certain medications to be wary of, which I will come on to as well. The other two answers weren't particularly chosen, um, so I won't kind of waste any time going through those. So this slide is basically just listing some of the drugs which are commonly associated with serotonin syndrome. Um, as we've mentioned, there are antidepressants, there are plenty of analgesics, most notably tramadol and fentanyl, um, antiemetics, and also your recreational drugs. And these are the sorts of things that you want to try and elicit from reading the stem of the question or when taking a history from a patient. And that's why it's important to take a very detailed medication history. So how does it present? Well, it's normally a classical triad of autonomic hyperactivity. So autonomic disturbance um, can present as hypertension, tachycardia, hyperthermia, um, excessive sweating, and midriasis, so pupil dilatation. Um, so a variety of ways, really, um, but it's normally these sorts of things that you want to look out for. Neuromuscular dysfunction, so that can present as a tremor, it can present as clonus, and this could be spontaneous or inducible clonus. Spontaneous clonus is quite rare, just to kind of be aware. You may have hypertonicity, hyperreflexia, so kind of upper motor neuron signs are associated. The third part is mental status changes. So this can be anxiety, agitation, confusion, or coma. And if you have kind of these three things together, they're more likely alongside a drug history suggestive of serotonin syndrome pointing towards this diagnosis. So the severity of symptoms can vary, really. It can be from mild to life-threatening. 
um, you can progress from restlessness to confusion to convulsions and you know even death in the severest of cases. Normally there's not any sorts of skin changes so if you're thinking about drug eruptions and Stephen Johnson's those sort of things you don't tend to get um, any uh, dermatology changes with serotonin syndrome and that kind of helps to differentiate it from other diagnoses. So what do you want to investigate? So you want to check use and ease and you want to check for the CK and that's to look for any evidence of rhabdomyolysis and consequent renal impairment. You want to do a toxicology screen and this is to look for any possible causative agents. And then you want to do FBC blood cultures, um, sample of if they're productive of sputum and um, if they have dysuria of urine, and that's to look for an alternative cause of fever. If patients have had trauma, seizures, hypertension, or if they have any focal neurology, you might consider doing a CT head. So it's not routine, it's sort of something to consider if the signs and symptoms suggest it. So how do we treat it? Well, mild cases normally resolve within 24 hours of stopping the causative agents. One important thing is to look at the half-lives of drugs. Obviously, drugs that have a longer half-life, for example, fluoxetine, which is an SSRI, that's kind of the only one that we really give to children and adolescents if needed in refractory cases. It takes a lot longer to break down and get out of your system. And that's why when we're changing from fluoxetine, we often have to give one to two weeks without any medication to let it get out of the system. So that's one thing to really consider when um, not actively treating. For moderate cases, if they have cardiovascular disturbances, then you can consider certain medications, but there's no definitive evidence of any efficacy for these medications. Um, one that's commonly cropped up in literature is cyproheptadine. Um, I wouldn't expect you to know the name of that, um, just to kind of be aware that there are certain things that can be used, but there's nothing that's definitive. The most important thing is stopping the causative drug. Severe cases, they're going to need aggressive treatment, early escalation to ITU, sedation, possibly ventilatory support. Um, so essentially escalating to the most relevant senior team. Activated charcoal, so this commonly comes up. Um, activated charcoal is often used as an antidote if ingestion has been one to two hours prior to you seeing the patient. So if it's a recent ingestion, you can sometimes use activated charcoal um, and that does commonly crop up in exams. So it's really important to look at the timeline of when patients are presenting. So, to prevent serotonin syndrome, it's very important to be cautious when prescribing these agents that all patients starting SSRIs need to be counseled about possible interactions, including over-the-counter medications, herbal medications. They need to know the signs and symptoms of serotonin toxicity um, and kind of just general education about if they do develop any of these signs, what the next step in management would be. So this slide essentially um, highlights the most important criteria for diagnosing serotonin toxicity, also known as serotonin syndrome. It's called the Hunter Serotonin Toxicity Criteria, and they've been developed following a large review of a series of patients that had a serotonergic drug overdose. And it essentially tells you whether you, the patient is likely to have a moderate or severe toxicity. So the most important thing to look for first is clonus. Clonus is usually inducible, meaning that it's triggered by an examiner. So when you're flexing the dorsiflexing the foot backwards and you see the clonus, that's inducible. In severe cases, clonus can be spontaneous and it can almost resemble a seizure-like activity. I have also mentioned, and it does say in the Hunter criteria, ocular clonus. So ocular clonus is a bit difficult to actually describe. Um, the best thing to do is try and find a video on YouTube about it. It's best described by imagining the eye connected to the end of a very long spring. 
And every time the patient voluntarily moves their eye, there's almost like a back and forth wobbling for a few seconds before the eye stabilizes. So it's sort of similar to the clonus that you can find on examination. So that's everything you need to know about serotonin syndrome and briefly also touching on neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll pop up the next question and I'll give you another 45 seconds or so to have a read and then also um, use the poll as well. Ten more seconds. Okay, so we've got about seventy three percent of you went for D, which is did you bind? and about 10% went for A, which is glucagon. So most of you got this right, actually, which is really good. Um, the correct answer is D, DigiBind. So we have an elderly lady who's been found by her neighbour with an empty bottle of medication. Um, she's complaining of xanthopsia, which is yellow vision. Um, it's listed all her comorbidities, and she's hypotensive, um, oxygen stable, and then really interesting with a digoxin overdose. The patient is experiencing severe digoxin toxicity, which you can um, occlude from the stem by the presence of an arrhythmia and also xanthopsia. So Patient civic antibody, also known as digibind, used in um, life threatening overdoses, but we will come on to that as well. A few of you went for glucagon. Um, I won't delve into that yet, as we will come on to that later on, but if you do have any other questions, just let me know. So, this is where we get digoxin from it's from the plant digitalis, and it's commonly used in atrial fibrillation. It's not commonly used as first line medication. If a patient has coexistent heart failure and AF, um, if they're elderly, more sedentary, um, then we tend to use digoxin, uh, but it's not typically first line. First line would be either a rate or rhythm limiting medication. Digoxin toxicity. So digoxin works by increasing the calcium inside the cells in your heart and it inhibits the sodium potassium pump in the cell membrane. By increasing intracellular calcium within the myocardium, you're thereby increasing the cardiac contractility. So that increases the risk of developing tachyarrhythmias. Inhibiting the sodium potassium pump causes hyperkalemia. And hyperkalemia is something I've highlighted because that commonly comes up in exam question stems. And that's always something to look out for. It's commonly associated with digoxin toxicity. As well as the things that I've mentioned, digoxin also increases your vagal activity and prolongs conduction in the AV node. So again, it's increasing your risk of developing arrhythmias. After 
taking a dose of digoxin, distribution to the tissues typically takes about several hours. So this means that the serum digoxin concentration is actually inaccurate if you take it immediately post-dose. So it's normally taken around six hours after the last dose is taken. The clinical features, alongside some of the other ones we will come across, are actually just quite non-specific. So general GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Things that are specific to the um, toxicity with digoxin would be xanthopsia and other visual disturbances more towards um, digoxin toxicity. So what we'll do is we'll look at what are the indications for a severe digoxin toxicity. So there's typically four that are commonly cited within literature, and they are persistent nausea and vomiting, heart block, heart failure, and cardiac arrhythmia. So in this stem, the patient did have an arrhythmia, they did have heart block, and they also were um, having some nausea and vomiting at the same time. So this points towards a more severe toxicity, which increases the um, rate of complications. So how do we manage it? Well, the first thing to do is to correct the, um, correct the electrolyte abnormalities. So you can have hypomagnesia and hypokalemia um, if a patient is kind of taking things like diuretics and things like that. So you, if they do have these, then you obviously need to correct those before starting. If you give somebody digoxin specific antibody fragments, that will further lower their potassium. So you want their potassium to kind of be more at the higher end rather than the lower. As we've mentioned before, you can give activated charcoal in patients who present within one to two hours of acute ingestion, and you can give digibine. One thing to remember is sometimes in examinations, they might just say um, antibody specific, um, antibody specific fragments, but they might not specifically say did you bind to try and catch you out. And so that's just something to be aware of um, when doing exams and things. I've listed a few of the other um, management options that can be undertaken in patients with severe toxicity. There isn't really any sorts of um, guidelines. It's more so treating the problems that arise. So if your first line treatment for digoxin toxicity fails, the next step would sort of be the digoxin specific antibody fragments. Patients typically respond quite quickly, normally within 30 minutes, and the full effect is normally seen. Atropine is conversely good for bradycardias. Um, if there was persistent heart block, then you might consider temporary pacing and DC cardioversion. If there's um, life-threatening arrhythmias where you can't give digibind, um, then you might try cardioversion. Obviously, if you are, then it's better to start with lower energies and build it up. So what I've done is I've just included the typical reverse tick pattern that you can see. So reverse tick pattern is the classic scooped out or down sloping ST segment that you can see here. Um, and it is synonymous with uh, digoxin toxicity. So if you do see that, this should kind of be at the forefront of your mind. So that's everything about digoxin. Um, we'll move on to the next question. And same thing again, around 45 seconds. 
10 seconds. Okay, so quite split actually. Um, about a third of people went for B, Amio drone, and a third went for E, um, and then it split between A and C. So a bit mixed across the board. Okay, so around a third of you got this right and went for E, IV bicarbonate. So this is a patient um, who's relatively young, um, has had previous overdose attempts and a background of severe depression that's taking amitriptyline. Okay. Um, ECG shows wide QRS complexes. So in this particular case, the overdose is likely to be caused by amitriptyline. So overdoses at amitriptyline and other tricyclics um, are characterized by an coma, respiratory depression, tachycardia, um, which we will come on to. Um, but it sort of tells you in the question what the most likely diagnosis is. So it's more so a matter of knowing what the treatment for that is. So indications for TCAs, um, we don't typically use them. Um, SSRIs are first line. If SSRIs fail to manage the depression, you can obviously try increasing the dose. Um, you can try SNRIs, um, kind of very, very low down, not very on the list are TCAs, um, which used to be very popular and they're not anymore. So their use is quite limited, although it is still used. Um, just not very often. And the reason for that is because they can very easily um, present with an overdose and an overdose can be very difficult to manage. Um, they can also be used for migraine prophylaxis. Um, we typically use propanolol or topiramate, um, obviously not using topiramate in um, women of pregnancy age, um, but kind of if those two first line fails, we can consider TCAs as well. So how do they work? Um, they inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin in the central nervous system. And as a result, they can lead to seizures. In toxicity, they can block alpha, block alpha receptors, muscarinic, histamine, and sodium channels, which is why they're such a problem. It's why we don't tend to use them so much. So by blocking alpha receptors, we can cause hypertension blockade of muscarinic receptors that can cause signs of anticholinergic toxicity, such as dry mouth, fever, tachycardia, blocking histamine receptors that can affect your mental status, and blocking sodium channels that slows down your action potentials. Um, and you can therefore get QRS prolongation, and that can lead to heart block, it can lead to bradycardia, um, and it can also fatally sometimes cause torsades to points. So how do we treat it? First line again, activated charcoal. We see it quite a lot. If, it, if a patient presents within one to two hours, we can try activated charcoal. The other thing we can do is try an um, alkaline, alkalinization with sodium bicarbonate. So generally with TCA overdose, they're quite difficult to manage. After supportive measures, so fluid resuscitation, making sure a patient's hemodynamically stable, we can try IV bicarbonate. These patients tend to need ITU support as a patient does deteriorate quite quickly. Um, it can be effective and it can help re resolve an acidosis, it can help minimize cardiovascular complications, but generally you do need to have senior support available. So what happens if sodium bicarb therapy fails to improve the cardiac symptoms? So then you can go to your kind of antidysrhythmic drugs or magnesium, um, but we have to be very careful because class one antiarrhythmic drugs appear to worsen the sodium channel blockade, slow the velocity, depress contractility, and therefore we need to avoid them completely in TCA poisoning. So I hope you're starting to build up a picture about why we don't like to use these anymore. You know, in severe refractory cases, we might go down the line of temporary pacemakers if there's a refractory symptomatic bradycardia, if it's not responding to sodium bicarb, then we're sort of hitting kind of last line therapy. Um, 
as I've mentioned at the bottom, you know, correction of hypoxia, hypovolemia, you know, ensuring patients are hemodynamically stable is usually sort of first line. Um, and then sodium bicarb is sort of the next big thing that you can try. If you have seizures, then you treat them as you normally would with diazepam or lorazepam IV. So we'll move on to the next question. Another 10 seconds. Okay, so most people have gone for the correct answer, which is C, IV naloxone. A few people went for flumazenil. So this is your typical opioid overdose. You have a heroin user, pinpoint pupils, you know, really depressed respiratory rate. These are the classical features um, of opioid toxicity. And this is again, significant, possibly life-threatening, and it requires treatment with naloxone. Um, so what causes it? Um, alcohol, other sedatives, anything that's opiate or opioid de derivatives, so things like heroin um, can cause an overdose. It results in the typical symptoms, as we've mentioned, um, and overdoses of agents combining an opiate and paracetamol, don't forget things like cocodamol, they can also cause the same effects initially. So it's always important to take that drug history. Investigation, so we like to do our baseline investigations. Um, these should be performed in kind of all patients with you know, a moderate to severe toxicity, and that will include your FBC, your CK to check the kidneys, your ABG, your metabolic screen. How do we treat it? So. Quite simply, naloxone. It's a specific antidote which needs to be administered if patients are symptomatic, if they're bradycardic, if their you know, respiratory rates are really depressed, if their GCS is low, um, then we need to administer naloxone. If it's a very mild overdose, um, if you know a patient comes in and the observations are fine, GCS is 15, you can consider not treating it. So the issue we have with naloxone is it's got a very, very short half-life. So often you need to give repeat doses of it. Um, when I've given it in the past, often, you know, your patient, you know, magically perks up, they're, they wake up, they're very annoyed at you that you've woken them up from, you know, their overdose um, that they've taken. And then quite often they, you know, go back down again. You often get a fast bleep that, you know, the patient's GCS has gone from 15 back down to 10, 11. Um, and so that normally it just needs a repeat dose until a substantial amount's been ingested and kind of until it's out of their system. Um, obviously, education is important long term about the risks um, and also the risks of um, serious overdose. Methadone, we do use. Um, it's normally dispensed daily, normally by uh, somebody like a pharmacist, and it's normally consumed un under supervision. Um, and it has really greatly reduced some of the risks of um, opioid overdose. Obviously, the issue with that is that people might be taking their methadone and still taking their um, opioids. Um, but it, it is commonly used alongside other sort of drug rehab programs as well. Um, patients who miss a few doses of their methadone, they need to be re, um, re-dosed. So normally you have to work out what dose is needed for this specific patient. It normally takes a couple of days. It's normally done um, by a specific drug um, clinic or GP. 
Um, so it, it's not something you normally see in secondary care. So that's pretty much everything for opioids. We'll move on to the next. Okay, so I'm pleased to see ninety seven percent of you went for B, which is NAC. Um, NAC is obviously first line in a paracetamol overdose and it conjugates, neutralizes the paracetamol toxins, which we'll come on to. Um, a couple of people have activated charcoal. Um, so as we've mentioned, activated charcoal can be given if the tablets were ingested normally within exams, it says the past hour, where it can be within kind of one to two hours, um, obviously referring to the relevant guidelines before initiating that. So in this situation, it says the tablets were taken over the past four hours. So we can't give activated charcoal in this instance. Um, None of you went for the other three options. Um, D doesn't, it's not, it's rarely used. It used to be used um, for drug overdoses in a weak acid, such as salicyclates, but we don't use that anymore. Um, one interesting thing to just to point out is E, um, we do actually use this if a patient is known to be allergic to NAC. Um, so it's a good alternative to just bear in mind. Um, there's actually little evidence to suggest either has a greater efficacy, but NAC is just a standard treatment of choice that might be due to cost reasons or just kind of ease of guidelines and things like that. The paracetamol overdoses. In the UK, it's one of the most common agents of intentional self-harm. Obviously, pack sizes are now limited and that reduces the size of an overdose and therefore the number of deaths and liver transplants required. It's really important um, to know how it works. So after you take paracetamol orally, it's well absorbed from the stomach and the small intestine, and it reaches peak concentration in about an hour. Um, it's maybe about 30 minutes if you take it in liquid form. And it's mainly inactivated by the liver and it's conjugated through two metabolites and it's renally excreted through the urine. Now, when you take it in overdose, the conjugation in the liver becomes inundated and that causes paracetamol to be metabolized by a different pathway. And that results in the toxic metabolite you might have heard called NAPKI. And that itself is inactivated by glutathione, which rapidly normally presents any harm. However, if your glutathione stores are depleted, then NAPKI reacts with the cell and leads to necrosis, and you typically get necrosis in the liver and the kidney. So this is the paracetamol normogram. I'd recommend looking it up and you know briefly studying it because it does often come up. So what we normally do is we only measure plasma paracetamol at four hours after ingestion. And that's the only point where the, they call it a line, it's more of a curve can be used. So patients at risk of liver, liver damage and therefore requiring NAC can be identified by measuring the plasma paracetamol and looking at the time interval after the ingestion. So you essentially plot it on the curve. If the, um, the concentration of paracetamol falls on or above above the treatment line, then that tells us we need to give this patient NAC. If it presents below 
then typically you might want to monitor. It depends on what their LFTs are, how the patient is clinically, are they symptomatic? But it normally it, it, it indicates us that we don't need to give um, NAC to this patient. The majority of overdoses normally um, are less than 20 grams and they normally don't cause any problems. Um, you do need to ingest kind of a fair amount for it to, to cause you a lot of harm. So signs and symptoms, commonly patients are actually asymptomatic for the first 24 hours or they have kind of vague symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdo pain. Um, after 24 hours, that's when you start to get the hepatic necrosis and that's going on to the development of the NAPP, affecting the liver necrosis and also affecting the kidneys. Patients may develop encephalopathy, oliguria, hypoglycemia, lactic acidosis. You know, patients can um, really deteriorate quite quickly after this after this um, 24 hour period. So we obviously want to check the kidneys. We want to look for renal failure. We want to check the liver functions, in particular the um, intracellular liver, liver enzymes, your ALT. Um, we want to keep an eye on everything that um, measures synthetic liver function. So your glucose, um, your clotting screen, your ABG to look for acidosis, um, and obviously your paracetamol level at four hours. So NAC um, is obviously something that we use. The activated charcoal I've mentioned, if you've ingested it within the past one to two hours, and in severe cases, you might need liver transplant. So the only thing I want to mention is a staggered overdose. So a staggered overdose is when the tablets are taken over more than a one hour period. So if a patient comes in and says, I've taken 30 paracetamol tablets for 500, grams each, 500 milligrams each, if it's taken within the same hour, that's not considered a staggered overdose. If it's more than an hour, it's considered a staggered overdose. And the implication of that is we don't use the normogram. And what we do is if a patient comes in with a staggered overdose, we just treat it with NAC. NAC is normally weight based. Um, so we initiate treatment straight away. So referral to a specialist unit, um, these criteria, you know, haven't changed since I first read them many years ago. So it's always worth having a look at them um, and just kind of getting your head around the sorts of things that indicate a patient might need a referral to a liver specialist unit, query transplantation. Obviously encephalopathy, persistently raised ANR, persistent renal impairment, persistent acidosis. These are all sorts of things that um, tell you that post NAC, you know, treatment really isn't quite working. We might need to consider alternative pathways. We'll move on to the next question. Um, that's everything you need to know about paracetamol overdose. Okay, so we've got 75% of you went for A, aspirin, and then it's equally split between C and E. So with this question, patients had ongoing headaches, um, they would take something over the counter. So already this can't be D because oxycodone is only available on prescription. An ABG shows respiratory alkalosis. Well, we've just been through paracetamol and we've mentioned that it causes a lactic acidosis. So it's unlikely to be paracetamol. So that leaves us with cocodamol and promethazine. 
Now, promethine rarely is taken um, just for ongoing headaches. Normally, there'll be an actual clinical diagnosis. Um, so it leaves us with cocodamol. Cocodamol is obviously codeine and paracetamol. Well, there's no signs of the paracetamol toxicity, as we've mentioned, and codeine. So codeine will represent an opioid toxicity if taken um, in excess. So that will be your respiratory depression, um, respiratory acidosis, and the paracetamol would be the nausea, the vomiting, the abdo pain, also an acidosis. But there's none of that in this scenario. So that leaves us with aspirin. With salicyclate poisoning, with aspirin being the most common um, salicyclate, um, you typically get an alkalosis. So it's always a good indicator um, of a salicyclate overdose. A small amount of this is excreted via the kidneys. Um, so it's always important to check the use and ease. Aspirin is a type of NSAID and it has antiplatelet effects um, and it also suppresses your prostaglandin and thromboxane synthesis. But the most kind of important thing to remember is that it's related to an alkalosis. The signs and symptoms, again, are a bit vague, a bit nonspecific, nausea, vomiting, lethargy. In severe poisoning, you can have dehydration, restlessness, bounding pulses, high respiratory rate. Um, in bloods, you may have hypokalemia, again, um, and also low blood sugars. And in really severe cases, you can have confusion, coma and convulsions, but that's less commonly seen in adults. Um, aspirin is the most common salicyclate in regular use, and so poisoning can be common. In adults, it initially causes a respiratory alkalosis, and that because it directly stimulates the respiratory centres in the medulla. So although aspirin itself is an acid, the salicyclate itself does not contribute to an acidosis. And it's interesting to note in the second phase of aspirin toxicity, it results in a metabolic acidosis. And that's because it interferes with aerobic respiration, which increases your lactate. And we know that lactate causes an acidosis. So it's always interesting to bear in mind um, that it can cause either an alkalosis or an acidosis. And if it's an immediate presentation post-ingestion, it's more likely to be a respiratory alkalosis. So I've included the plasma salicyclate levels here. Um, I wouldn't um, recommend kind of learning them to differentiate between mild, moderate and severe, but I thought it was important to highlight kind of how we classify the severity. Plasma salicyclate levels can be measured in a hospital. You can get a result normally within a, typically a few hours. Um, so it's quite quick to do. Um, it causes hypokalemia, so it's important to measure potassium. You'd also want to check the use and ease anyway because it's renally excreted. Um, and an ABG, obviously, to see whether there's the early um, respiratory acidosis or later metabolic alkalosis. Um, in young children, um, they do commonly present with an acidosis, just to add that extra layer of confusion for you. But the important thing to remember is that there is some degree of acid-based disturbance in most cases. So how do we manage it? If it's presented in, within an hour, we give activated charcoal. If they've had more than, let's say, 500 milligrams per kg, so, you know, a relatively large amount, um, we can consider gastric lavage. Um, aggressive rehydration is sort of the next line in management of uh, salicyclate poisoning. Um, elimination of salicyclate can also be increased by alkalization of urine. Um, so urinary alkalization is commonly mentioned in exams, but in practice, it's actually not used very often. Um, correction of electrolytes kind of speaks for itself. If there's something wrong, fix the problem first. Um, and then for severe poisoning, kind of refractory cases, we're thinking about hemodialysis um, and that's to kind of eliminate the salicyclate uh, from the bloodstream. So we'll move on to the next question. I'm aware that we are nearly approaching half past. We did start about 10 minutes um, past the time we normally do. But if anybody does need to leave, 
The feedback form is in the chat. I'd really appreciate you filling that out. Um, and this will be available on YouTube afterwards. We have another three questions. So I anticipate another 10 to 15 minutes maximum, and then I'll hang around afterwards for questions as well. Um, so if anybody does need to leave, um, please do the form and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. If not, then I'll move on to the next question. Okay, so it's fairly split between B and C, sodium bicarbonate fluid resuscitation, about 40% each. Um, which is interesting. So in this case, you have a patient with bipolar who's recently started a um, thiazide diuretic, got a fine tremor and lithium level is slightly high at 1.6. It tells you in the stem, um, we're suspecting lithium toxicity. So benzothiazide actually increases the concentration of lithium through its effect on sodium reabsorption. Um, so, it's telling you already before you even got to the last line that this is likely a lithium um, toxicity. So the correct answer is C. I will come on to Y in a second. There we go. So lithium is commonly used to treat bipolar. Um, it's normally first line. Most patients take it. There's a big problem with lithium that it's very easily becomes toxic. And that is why when we initiate lithium, when we change the dose of lithium, if a patient's taking medications affecting your sodium, we have to measure serum lithium concentrations until they're stable. So lithium is a monovalent cation, which is very similar to sodium, but it has an unknown mechanism. So when you have sodium and volume depletion due to vomiting, diarrhea, fever, renal disease, excessive exercise, excessive sweating, um, low sodium diet, this enhances the amount of um, lithium that's reabsorbed in the kidneys and can therefore lead to toxicity. Um, AV heart block can occur in toxicity, although first degree heart blocks more commonly seen rather than complete heart block. So we'll move on to how to manage it. We've obviously spoken about things that precipitate it. So dehydration, renal failure, diuretics, especially thiazides, which affects the sodium and features of toxicity. So a fine tremor is actually normal. Um, it's normally seen when a patient's taking lithium and their lithium concentration is within the therapeutic range. A coarse tremor, however, is a sign of toxicity. So it's important to, to remember that. Um, other features are hyperreflexia, confusion, seizures, coma, um, and obviously measuring use and ease um, that will um, give us an indicator of whether the kidneys are affected as well. So how do we manage it? Well, if a patient has had significant ingestion, you can consider whole bowel irrigation, but generally the most kind of prevalent treatment for toxicity is supportive. So it's normally um, having special regard for electrolyte balance, uh, renal function, controlling seizures, um, 
and adequate fluid intake. So it's more kind of conservative measures to ensure a patient is stable rather than having um, a medication such as an opioid overdose that can reverse it. So essentially there's no naloxone for lithium. Um, and unfortunately, it is one of the medications that very easily um, can go over into toxicity. In acute overdoses, um, if there's no clinical signs and symptoms, you can um, try and increase urinary excretion by um, making sure there's adequate fluid intake, but you should not give diuretics because that can precipitate the problem and make it worse. There is some discussion about raising urinary pH, but it's nothing that's commonly seen. Um, you know, sodium bicarb is sometimes used um, in toxicity for alkalization of urine, but it, it might be something that comes up in exams, but it's not something that's typically done in practice. If there's renal failure, or if all of the above supportive measures fail to increase clinical condition and reduce plasma lithium, then kind of your last line is always kind of hemodialysis, really, because it can remove the concentration um, of lithium in the blood. Given the pre presentation in this case with seizures um, and, and marker based lithium, then obviously we're thinking more so about hemodialysis. So if in a question stem you have a patient that presents with all of the features of severe toxicity, so the confusion, the seizures, the coma, then we're thinking more along the lines of hemodialysis rather than and, you know, kind of fluid resuscitation and electrolyte balance. So in this question, um, the patient was relatively stable. They had sort of, you know, severe pain, nausea, drowsiness. Um, they had a fine tremor, so it hadn't yet progressed to that coarse tremor. And their lithium level wasn't too bad. Um, so in this case, kind of fluid resuscitation would be a good first line me measurement and also stopping any interacting medications that might cause it. So just by stopping the thiazide, we're already going to be improving the problem. So kind of mild toxicity symptoms will be the nausea, the diarrhea, the dizziness, um, you know, fine tremor. Um, so it's important to kind of bear that in mind, whether it's mild to moderate or severe. Um, Hemodialysis, we've spoken about. Um, a few people did go for sodium bicarb, which we've mentioned. Urinary alkalization is not commonly used. Um, so we'll move on. That's everything that's kind of most pertinent to know about lithium toxicity. We've got two more questions. So I'll pop the next one up on screen now. Okay, so I can't see how everybody voted. Oh, there we go. Ah, perfect. Well, 100% of you went for C, which is carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, I have full faith in you that that's not because we're doing a lecture on overdose and that's the only <laughs> overdose available. Um, I have full faith that you knew the signs and symptoms associated, but regardless, I will, you know, go through them as well. So carbon monoxide poison is actually a really difficult diagnosis to make clinically. Um, the, the two kind of most important signs to look out for are confusion and the pink mucosa. And these are the typical features associated. Most patients present with a headache, nausea, vomiting, 
um, if there's severe toxicity, they might have hyperparexia, coma, um, and things like that as well. So what is it? It's a colorless, tasteless, odorless gas, and it's normally in kind of faulty uh, furnaces, engine exhausts, if there's a fire. Um, unique symptoms um, can sometimes be associated, such as chronic fatigue or polycythemia. So it can be a chronic problem. If there's an issue with the, you know, gas issues within a house, um, somebody might come in with these vague sort of chronic symptoms of pain in their tummy, polycythemia, chronic fatigue, recurrent infections. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, conventional pulse oximetry can't distinguish between carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. So a traditional pulse oximeter will be falsely high. So regardless of what the pulse oximetry shows, if you're suspecting this diagnosis, treatment will be with 100% oxygen. What we will do typically in um, practice is do an ABG, and that can show a metabolic acidosis. We'll do an ECG to see if there's any myocardial damage, any signs of infarction or ischemia. Um, but it's important to um, know for exams that direct spect is a direct measurement of um, carboxyhemoglobin in a blood gas analyzer, and that's actually gold standard investigation. Um, whereas most people would be tempted to go for an ABG because that's what we would tend to do in clinical practice. Um, in severe practice, in, in severe cases, we can do uh, use the knees. Um, if there's a metabolic acidosis, if there's a high lactate, um, we want to make sure the kidneys are okay and stable. Um, if symptoms are really severe, we may get a chest x-ray. Um, you might get pulmonary edema. Um, it, it really depends whether it's an acute or chronic presentation. So we give 100% oxygen. Um, evidence shows that this reduces the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin, and it may be required for up to 24 hours. Um, norm, giving oxygen removes the carbon uh, monoxide at a faster rate um, by increasing the partial pressure of oxygen. Um, so that increases the dissociation rate of carbo carb monoxide from hemoglobin. So by increasing the oxygen, it's kind of telling the carbon monoxide to move out of the way and then the oxygen binds with the hemoglobin. So it is a difficult diagnosis to make. Um, obviously long-term, as we've mentioned, long-term prevention will be removing the person from the source, getting the fire team involved, um, you know, checking houses, things like that. And if there is cerebral edema in very, very severe cases, we typically give mannitol uh, by IV injection. Um, but I wouldn't expect that to typically come up in an examination. So we have one more question, which we'll go on to now. And then we will summarise and close, and then I will stay a few moments for any questions. Ten seconds left. Okay, so about forty percent have gone for for mepizol, and then it's twenty and twenty for B and C, um, flumazenil and desferioxamine. Okay. So it's important to, to differentiate between fomepazole and flumazenil, and I purposely put both of them as answers because there's often a lot of confusion between the two. So fomepazole inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase, and historically um, we treat an uh, overdose of antifreeze, also known as ethylene glycol, 
with ethanol. So typically, you know, back in the day, they used to get a bottle of vodka from the, you know, local supermarket or local corner shop and give that to the patient. And that will counteract the ethylene glycol in the antifreeze. We don't like to give alcohol to our patients <laughs> and we found a much better solution and that's to give the mepizol. Um, I'll come on to kind of how that works in a moment. I just want to touch on flumazenil. Flumazenil is a benzodiazepine antagonist. So it's therefore used to treat benzo overdoses. And it's important to know how it works because this sometimes does come up in examinations. It competitively in that can bind to the receptors. The majority of overdoses are typically actually managed with supportive care um, due to the risk of seizures by giving flumazenil. But in an exam scenario, if flumazenil is the only option for a benzo overdose, that's typically the right answer. But it's normally in clinical practice. We only use it for kind of severe overdoses. And I will come on to desferioxamine as well shortly. So the right answer, as I have said, is bamepizol. Um, ethylene glycol is a sweet liquid normally found in antifreeze. Um, people like to drink it because they think it's alcohol um, or it's got alcohol content in it and it hasn't. Um, it's rapidly absorbed through the GI tract. Uh, when it's broken down in the body, it results in toxic metabolites such as glycolic acid and oxalic acid. And these are what cause most of the problems with toxicity. So it's metabolized in the liver and it goes to um, glycoaldehyde and it's metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase. While the ethylene glycol itself causes intoxication, the accumulation of the metabolites is what causes a potentially fatal acidosis and renal failure and therefore poisoning. Early symptoms can be intoxication, vomiting, abdo pain, you know, kind of the sorts of non-specific things we've mentioned. And um, in terms of investigations, obtaining a toxic alcohol concentration is quite difficult. It's, it's not something you're going to get in a hospital um, and it probably will take hours to days and you'll have to send it to an outside lab. But it's not something that's normally done, although they sometimes put it in as a bit of a red herring in examinations. There's nothing really specific um, that we need to investigate for. But with any patient coming in with a moderate severe toxicity, you would do your routine FBC using these LFTs to check for any signs of impairment. To treat it, a gastric lavage, if it's a severe overdose, um, we don't typically do that. Patients don't like it. Um, it can be done though. Um, and that's the important thing to remember, especially for examinations. Gastric de decontamination is, is normally kind of used if it's within an hour of ingestion. So it's coming back to that. Is it within an hour? Can we do this? If not, then the next step is to give the mepizol, which inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase. So it's normally first line therapy. If it's refractory cases, then we might consider hemodialysis. So I've just got one final slide. Um, and this is just some of the ones we haven't mentioned, but I wanted to make sure that I've highlighted for you to know about. Um, but these are the ones where there's not as much kind of theory to know, but it's important to know the overdoses and to read around them. So benzodiazepines we've mentioned, um, they can, Flumazenol competitively inhibits the GABA uh, benzo receptor complex. Um, majority are managed with supportive care. Um, flumazenil can increase your risk of seizures. That's important to remember. Heparin overdose, um, the antidote is protamine. It binds to low molecular weight heparin and it forms a stable pair, which doesn't have any anticoagulant activity at all. The complex is removed by the body and broken down by your reticular endothelial system. The protamine works very well. Atropine, um, so atropine is commonly classified as an anticholinergic or antiparasympathetic, and it works by increasing the heart rate and improving the AV conduction by blocking the parasympathetic influence on the heart. So we use it in a beta blocker overdose if the patient's bradycardic, and it's typically first line 
but if a patient is not bradycardic, if they um, are resistant, if it's a particularly large overdose, then we tend to go for glucagon. Um, Glucagon works by increasing the heart rate, increasing the myocardial contractility, and it improves the AV conduction. And then last but not least is desferioxinane. This is a chelating agent. So chelating agents are chemical compounds that react with a metal ion to form a stable complex. And they're essentially chelating agents are used to reduce blood and tissue level of heavy metals. So for anybody that knows about Wilson's disease, that's when you have an excess of copper in the blood. We use chelating agents to remove the copper from the blood. So that's when you might have come across that. But the specific form to remove iron is desferioxamine. So it's important to know that. To summarize, we've gone through the antidotes for common drug overdoses. We've touched upon the difference between neuroleptic malignant syndrome and serotonin syndrome. Um, we've been through the signs and symptoms of various um, drug overdoses and toxicity, as well as looking at the management. And we've also looked at the treatment normogram. I think we are good on time. Um, apologies if anybody did have to leave. I know we did start about 10 minutes late. Um, the feedback forms in the chat. What I will do now is if anybody has any questions, just pop them into the chat and I will go through them. I think I have seen one somewhere. But thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a lovely evening. Um, if you do have any follow up questions, just let me know. Um, if anybody actually is on past medicine, there's a really handy table that just lists all of the antidotes to common poisons. So it lists all the ones I've been through. Um, but if anybody can't get a copy of it or isn't a member of Past Medicine, um, just let me know and I can send that across to you, not a problem. So I'll just go through the questions. Um, does the toxin toxicity cause hyperkalemia? Why would we give IV potassium? So this is a re I'm really glad you asked this actually, because we did briefly touch upon this. So Toxicity in digoxin is triggered by hypokalemia. So benzodiazepines, uh, benzodiazepines benzofluminosides, diazide diuretics, remove um, sodium potassium from the blood and therefore cause hypokalemia. Hypokalemia um, can cause digoxin toxicity. When you have digoxin toxicity, that itself can cause hyperkalemia, high potassium. So hypokalemia can cause the toxicity. The toxicity itself can cause hyperkalemia. So it's really important to keep on top of the user needs and keep on top of the management. And it's important to remember if we give digibind, that can also reduce your serum potassium so we want to make sure we've given enough normally IVI with 40 millimoles KCL will be sufficient to kind of make sure we're in a good therapeutic range for potassium. I hope that makes sense if you have any other follow-up questions more than happy to answer them. Um, I will hang around for a little while. I have another question do you mind talking about neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Yes of course not a problem. Um, what I'll do is I'll just flip the question just to give you a bit of context there we go okay so this is the question regarding serotonin syndrome and neuromoleptic syndrome so neuromoleptic syndrome it tends to be caused by antipsychotics so that's normally a really good indicator um, of the possible diagnosis and it's typically caused by your typical and your atypical antipsychotics. Um, so it, it's not really differentiated between the two. The important thing to remember is with neuroleptic malignant syndrome is it develops over hours, um, over days to weeks rather than hours. So in a question stem, it's normally serotonin syndrome and they've added a medication within the last 24 hours, um, which is therefore caused um, the, the symptoms described. The symptom, the signs and symptoms are actually very similar um, to what you would find in serotonin syndrome. And that's why it's actually really difficult to diagnose between the two. And so 
typically your drug history is more so the indicative factor of what the likely diagnosis is. So the typical symptoms will be things like hypothermia, um, rigidity, slow reflexes. Um, you, don't you don't typically get the hyperreflexia and my myoclonus that you might see in serotonin syndrome. So I hope that makes sense so far. Let me see if I have another question about it. Oh, in terms of management as well, um, there's a, it's very difficult to manage actually. There are certain medications we can give to counteract the toxicity. Um, things like dantrolene or bromocryptine, amantadine we can use. Um, again, the sort of similar things with supportive management. Um, but both of these conditions are very um, difficult to diagnose. It's just important to remember that serotonin syndrome causes hyperreflexia, myoclonus, whereas neuroleptic malignant syndrome is more so rigidity, hyporeflexia, so slow reflexes. And obviously it's a slower onset, so it's normally one to two weeks after changing the dose of a medication. And then the similar sort of symptoms will be like the altered mental status. I hope that makes sense. If you have any more questions about that, I'm more than happy to answer those. I think the most important to distinguish between the two is whether tone and reflexes are increased or decreased. So obviously you get more rigidity in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, whereas serotonin syndrome is more so clonus, hyperreflexia and tremor. So it's just looking for the really fine um, distinguishing features between the two. I will hang around for a few more moments in case there are any more questions. There's a few people hanging around. somehow managed to get to the end. Thank you so much, Manji. If there aren't any more questions, I'll um, end the call for everyone. That's lovely. Thank you very much for your help as well, Millie. Have a good evening, everyone.